when you enter into this listing agreement, one of the activities that you are going to be required to do is obviously marketing the property to your fullest extent to make sure that you ensure to bring a suitable candidate for a buyer. So part of your listing and at least your listing presentation is going to be a marketing plan that is going to explain to your client how you market the property for sale. What are you going to do? Now, one of the things I think is important for you to understand is there are some words that you should not use when marketing a property. Any word that could potentially allow for your seller to be compromised in their ability to negotiate. One of the favorite words that I see listed all the time is this word, oops. When I first started as a Caldwell banker, that word was actually outlawed. And I don't mean legally, I mean in our uh, agency. We actually had a list of words that we would have to go over with the seller and have them sign off saying that we could use certain words and certain words we could not. Pre-foreclosure, short sale, motivated. Now, some of those like short sale now is actually a required disclosure. Uh, if the sales price doesn't cover the outstanding note, that's actually a checkbox in our listing agreement. When I first started, that was actually a word that was a no-no. You had to actually have permission to say that the seller was in foreclosure or that he was motivated or you know any of those words and we had a list of them that our seller would go through and initial beside each word if we could use that inside of the marketing. So you make sure that you probably should ask, and this is the one right now that it gives me the most heartache, is because when someone says they are motivated, that typically means to the other side that they potentially could be desperate for an offer. That might incur the buyer to offer a lower price if he heard that word than he would have normally offered if he thought it was a quote unquote competitive sale. So I would encourage you to probably check with your seller if some of these words are okay. Now, some sellers might say, yes, use the word motivated. I am motivated. <laughs> Just because they're motivated doesn't mean you need to necessarily market them as being motivated. All right. So check with your seller in this advertising campaign to make sure that it's okay to use things like one of my favorite sentences we used to use all the time when a client was motivated. I remember I marketed a property once and it said, kick me, I'm down. That was one of the things we used. Uh, I had a house long time ago, uh, Johnson County over on Railroad Road. No, actually it, it would be in Marion County still, I believe, where they actually wanted to leave their cat. The sellers were moving to Alaska because they were backpackers and they wanted to live that outdoor life and their cat was used to the house and the neighborhood. So they actually, one of the things we discussed was, would the new current seller or the current buyer be willing to keep the cat so the cat could stay in its local environment? So we actually marketed the property as buy a $99,000 cat, get a house for free, okay? So make sure you talk to them about what is words you can use. You are also going to talk about your marketing campaign in general. What types of media are you going to use? Are you going to use print media, which is called industrial? Are you going to use social media? How are you going to 
uh, are you going to have a specific website for a property? I know when I was doing a lot of commercial work, we would actually make a website for that property. And the website URL was obviously the address of the property. So we had one, you know, it was www3145 north 31. That was a website that we had, and that was a method of marketing the property. Now, of course, you got to realize you need to use that domain name or that URL on all your marketing material because the idea was to drive as many people to there as possible. Are you going to use social media? Social media, what type of social media? Are you on Twitter? Are you going to do so, uh, Facebook? Are you going to have a Pinterest? And if you are going to use social media, one of the key things you need to understand is the pictures pictures there was a quote in one of the realtor magazines in 2019 it said pictures are now the modern day version of the drive-by and what they're meaning by that is in the old days people would drive by a house and look at it and say yes i like the house let's call an agent now in the technological days that we are in it is much easier to sit on one some website in your underwear at midnight and zoom through pictures and go yes i like the look of that house let's call our agent so pictures have become the new drive-by because it allows an agent or i'm sorry misspoke it allows that client to actually buyer client actually it allows that buyer client to sit and view many, many properties in a shorter time span, even on bad days that are gloomy or cold days they don't want to go out. So pictures have become the new drive-by. You need to understand this so that when you take pictures, that you take good pictures. What is a good picture versus what is a bad picture? Well, we teach a class at Real University called... Um, what is it, the eye of the photographer? And one of the things that I contend is there are a lot of agents that go, I want professional photography. Cool, I get that. But understand that the actual camera that you physically have is sufficient compared to the camera that the photographer is going to bring in. Now, I'm not saying that they are equal, but what I'm saying is for the still life, uh, pictures of a residential house your iphone is probably sufficient to give you a good quality picture what i contend is that the photographer has a much better eye than most agents you get a person that is a photographer and they understand the lighting meaning is or should the weight shades be up or down they understand the staging should we turn the chair at this angle? So it could be beneficial for you to seek out professional help to get your pictures, especially in my opinion, if you are going to start doing that high-end kind of home. Now, I understand the economics of this. If you are marketing a $100,000, $120,000 home, that home to the seller and buyer is just as valuable as some other home might be to another person. The problem is when you start looking at the economics and realize, hey, if I'm only going to charge, you know, four, four and a half, five percent and give most of that away to the other side, by the time I come in and make fifteen hundred or two thousand and spend five or six hundred dollars on pictures, this prop this endeavor is almost not worth it to me to spend the time and effort so you have to understand that some financial point there is a trade-off between what you're getting and what you're paying versus the overall income now there are people out there that will go yeah i understand and i don't work for less than you know if i don't make three thousand dollars i ain't doing a deal well that may not be the right attitude but i certainly understand the concept so I have always contended there needs to be a photographer out there that is willing to do his 
professional duty at some kind of great value so and they could gain a lot more business if there was a photographer that could do packages for like 99 bucks and give you four or five good pictures at that point it now becomes very economically feasible and you're not spending four or five hundred dollars to market a hundred thousand dollar listing more people tend to spend three or four or five hundred dollars if the commission is seven thousand eight thousand dollars i get the economics of that so just keep that in mind one of the other things that you may have to discuss with your client is the open house concept and what are your expectations for open houses i catch a lot of flack because i am not a huge believer in open houses a lot of my agents are and a lot of my agents do open houses and certainly i am not going to tell them they can't uh, i don't interfere with the business of the business of my agents i don't want to push upon them my belief but my belief is that most of us do open houses for two reasons one is to show your seller that you're actually doing something hey i'm having an open house that makes your seller feel good two is obviously we all understand it's to find other buyers that really don't like this open house the nar is going to tell you that less than two percent of all homes are ever sold at an open house now, before you open your mouth, I know there's going to be some of you out there and say, well, I've sold one. Yes, obviously they do sell, but in general, as a statistical number, less than 2% of all the homes ever sold are actually sold through a direct open house. Okay, so <clears throat> once again, that whole risk and reward, could you have spent better time and money potentially marketing that property on a social media site rather than sitting three hours in an open house. That's up to you to decide how you want to do it. But virtually overall, you need to think of all of these things that may go into the marketing of your client's property, all right? You've also got fair housing concerns when dealing with listings. And if you remember, there are seven federally protected classes inside of the fair housing so i want everybody to go ahead and repeat them with me what are they well that's not going to work eventually i'll get used to using this <clears throat> remember you got race color religion national origin sex familial status and disability. Those are the seven federally protected classes. Now, Indiana is a cut and paste state, meaning Indiana uses the federal laws. States can be more restrictive, not less restrictive. For instance, Washington state actually protects military status they protect sexual orientation uh, so they protect some more items than the feds in indiana we are a federal state so we have these seven protected classes that you that we use so it's the same seven in the state of indiana there is hopa which is the housing for older people this allows there to be those properties that are over 55 housing. That by definition is not discrimination. That is an age thing. And we discriminate on age all of the time, right? 16 to drive, 18 to vote, 21 to drink, 55 to get the good menu at Denny's. So we discriminate on housing or age all the time. We do have HOPA that we have to follow which involves those over 55 housing where someone may go, oh, I really want to live there. Well, you are not old enough to live in that housing addition. Well, that seems like it's discrimination. No, HOPA accounts for that. There are some exemptions to the fair housing. 
and there is an exemption to every one of these, except there is never an exception for race, all right? There is exemptions to all of those, and we are not going to go through every exemption, but there is no exception ever for race. All right, none. There's an exemption for the family status. For instance, you can only have two people in a bedroom. That's a safety rule. The disability, there's an economic rule. Hey, I can't afford to modify the house. So there are exemptions to all of that. At no time can you ever advertise any of those exemptions and advertising to the fair housing to me seems to be one of those issues that you cannot not violate. If you look up the advertising rules for fair housing, it's going to tell you that if you advertise in the Korean language, for example, that it tends to discriminate against people that are non-Korean. Well, that obviously makes sense, but here's the question. What is the official language of the United States? Go ahead, I'll wait. Think about it. How many of you said English? That is not the case. English is not the official language of the United States. There actually is none. We determined when we founded this country that we were supposed to be that big melting pot remember, of all these nationals and nationalities. It just so happens that the first founders that came over predominantly spoke English. So that's why we speak a lot of English here. There are people in this country that do not speak English. So in theory, when you go and put a sign up that says for sale in the English language, does that tend to discriminate against people that are non-English speaking? The answer most certainly is yes. So it is very hard to not, not violate the fair housing laws. Now I understand and I get the warm fuzzy that we all want to be, you know, treat everybody the equal and you should. And the reality is there is only one thing you should discriminate on. What is that? That. Green. You got the green, you're my client. You don't have the green, you're not my client. That's the easy principle for you to remember. You got money, you're my client. You don't have money, I can't help you. Nothing personal, you don't have money. All right? So remember that when you advertise that technically, you know, we could be in violation. Uh, I've always argued this and I've wanted to see, I probably should look up some, uh, court cases to see if there's ever been a trial against this whole advertising concept because I am questioning the fact that if we put it in English, is that typically discriminatory based on some of the, maybe the Burmese or the Indian culture or the Hispanic culture or the Chinese culture that come here and don't speak English? Technically, that could violate the FHA rules, all right? So think about that and let's uh, take a small break.